All right, good morning, church. So good to see you here this Lord's Day. We're going to go ahead and get started. Let's just uh, bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come now before you, God. We come to worship you, our great King of kings and Lord of lords. You are Lord Almighty. Lord, so easy to forget how great you are. Lord, as we're buffeted through each day of the week with our jobs and our circumstances and our concerns, but it's such a blessing to come in your presence, Lord, to just be reminded of how great and how awesome and powerful you are, to be able to lay our cares at your feet knowing that you care for us, to remember, Lord, that you sent your Son to bear our sin on the cross. And by your grace, Lord, you have poured out your Holy Spirit upon us. And knowing that all things work together for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose, such a blessing it is. So, Lord, we come now to worship you. We ask now that you would just cleanse our hearts, our minds. Lord, every distraction, help us to set those things aside. Help us, O Lord, to lift up holy hands and holy voices before you, God. We can't make ourselves holy. Only you can make us holy. Pour out your spirit, Lord, upon us today in the name of Jesus. Destroy every yoke. May the chains be broken in our lives today. Lord, anyone here in, under the sound of my voice or watching at home who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, may the word as it goes forth today be heard in a way it's never been heard before that brings conviction of sin and turns them to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. In everything we do and say, Lord, we want you to be glorified. In these things we ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand with us?
the nations rage. Oh, the nations rage. Kingdoms rise and fall. There is still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear for this truth. Above him. None above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and never stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. My God is the ancient of days. Verse 2. song. Just sing this song. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my 
Sing that again. Here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. The verse goes, I am. verse again.
more time. Speak what is true. Speak what is true. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you our hearts. Lord, we surrender all that we have to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can be here in this place to sing these worship songs to you, Lord. We pray that as a sweet aroma. Thank you that we can hear your word today, Lord. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I am excited to be here this morning. This is my first time to actually be here on the opposite schedule because we start with our last name is a C. So we've not been able to be here. I was seeing Tawan two weeks ago and it was like, hey, I haven't seen you this entire time. That's kind of crazy, um, which is sad. And exciting at the same time that we're going back. Yay! Um, thanks for being here at Calvary Chapel, Richmond. I just wanted to thank you guys for being here one more time. Uh, as you know, Pastor Tim is not here, but he will be back this week. So he'll be back from his Sabbath rest on Tuesday, and he'll be back with us next Sunday, although he won't be sharing. He'll be facilitating the baptism, which is pretty exciting. Uh, Twelve people getting baptized. That's pretty exciting. Praise the Lord for that. Um, and Lord willing, there will be even more um, because we're expecting the Lord to do big things always. Um, and I just want you guys to continue praying for Pastor Tim. He's taken this Sabbath rest. This is the first time for him to do that since he took over the lead here at Calvary Chapel Richmond. And these Sabbath rests are a blessing. They are a gift to someone who's in full-time ministry. And as someone who's been in full-time ministry for about 10 years and has taken a Sabbath rest before, I can tell you that it is life-altering and life-changing. And the, uh, most of us don't understand, unless you're in full-time ministry or you're in full-time leadership in ministry, the weight, the mantle is heavy. Whether you're there, whether you're inside of it or not, it is heavy. And I was ta talking with Trevor just a little while ago. It's like you don't really know how much weight is on you. And then you take a step in something that you've been doing every day and all of a sudden you feel that there's a ton on your back and you're like, wait, wait, wait. I always step out of my bed with my left foot every morning, but this morning it felt like that was the hardest thing that I could do. Um, so you guys continue to pray for Pastor Tim, continue to pray for all of those in spiritual leadership and just the leadership of our country and the leadership of this world. Um, and we're gonna take some time here in just a minute. And we're going to pray for revival for our country, and we're going to pray for revival for the world. We're going to pray for revival in us and in this church as well. So, uh, but I, I just wanted to say, continue to pray for Pastor Tim because he really needs that. And we're blessed by Pastor Tim because he keeps something very, very true, and not a lot of leaders do this. Pastor Tim wants, first wants to see Jesus go forth. He loves Jesus, and he wants to see Jesus go forth first in his own life, second in his family's life, third in the church, and fourth in the world. And that right there is the way that it should go. That's the latter step. First in your own, second in your family, third in the church, and fourth in the world. So continue praying for that. So let's, we're going to take some time like we do each week to pray for revival. We get, we get down on our knees, and we're going to spend about a minute uh, just really 
in, in your own silent way, praying for the world, praying for the United States, praying for each other for revival. And then I'll finish this up praying for revival. Uh, spend some time this morning praying for Pastor Tim for re- own revival in his own heart. Um, because I'm expecting Pastor Tim to come back and really feeling filled up in Jesus Christ. And really bring in a new vision and a new fire. Not that anything's changed. Just really his eyes more focused on Jesus. Um, which is an exciting thing. So let's, uh, let's get on our knees. If you're able to, if not, then you can just sit in your seats. If you're online joining with us, then please you can get on your knees where you are. And we will uh, pray for a little bit of revival. Just lift you up, God. We lift you up. We magnify you, Lord. We ask for your presence to go forth, God. Um, We pray for all of the spiritual leaders inside of this country, those who love you, who are called by your name, Lord, all those in spiritual leadership, Lord, and the leadership of your church. God, we pray for revival in their hearts, Lord. We pray that you would revive them, that you would give them strength, that you would uh, fill them up with your spirit, Lord. We pray for Pastor Tim, that you would be filling him up right now, even as we pray, God, that you would fill him up, Lord. Uh, we, We see the things that have been happening in the spiritual for so long now coming to to just reality in the flesh, God. We see many things in in our country, God, Uh, people attacking the church, attacking believers, Lord. We see people, uh, fines and and just, yeah, God, taking of the unborn, death, lives, celebrating things that have nothing to do with your kingdom, Lord. We, We see that in our country, Lord, and we come We come humbly right now before you on our knees, Lord. And Lord, I pray that this is the posture that your church is in every day, humbly begging for you to do something. Because God, we can do nothing. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And we ask, Lord, that as we humbly seek you, as we bow before you, as we sit in sackcloth and ashes, Lord, um, God, that you would revive our nation, that you would heal our land, that you would heal our hearts. God, let it start inside of us, inside of each one of us individually, inside of our families, Lord, corporately, Lord, inside of the body of Christ, the churches that are spread across this nation, Lord, and ultimately inside of the whole nation and the world, Jesus. We just ask for that. We pray for our president. We pray for our senators. We pray, Lord, that they would have a revival. God, uh, it's not unlikely to see leaders come to know you when your spirit moves. So God, we just ask for that. We ask for your spirit to fall, fall afresh on us, fall on this nation. And Lord, bring us to repentance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, as you get back to your seats, uh, we're going to be spending this morning jumping back and forth to a bunch of different scriptures. If you have your Bibles, you can flip to John 17. We're going to start there. And we're going to be coming back and forth to John 17 the whole time that, we're, that we are reading. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background information on John 17. As we see from John 13 to John 17, we are in Jesus' last time with his disciples. Jesus is in the upper room. It's the Passover feast. He washes his disciples' feet in John 13. And then he goes down and he starts giving his last words to his disciples. And if, if you have watched any movies where somebody gives their last word or you knew that you were about to pass, you would probably gather your closest friends and family together and you would want to give them something profound. You might even want to speak a word to them that would change their lives. And as we see that through John 13 through 17, or John 13 through 16, we see that Jesus is giving this profound word. A lot of the truths and a lot of the way that we live in the body of Christ today is from John 13, 14, 15, and 16. Abide in me, I will abide in you. The count 
the cost of discipleship, a lot of things are right in there. Um, so I'm excited this morning to share some of that. Right before we get to the end of that time, Jesus stops. He tells them in John 16, 33, take heart. In this world, you will have troubles, but take heart. I've overcome the world. And then he says, all right, let me stop and let me pray for you. And Jesus is actually praying. This is one of the few times that we actually see Jesus bowing down and praying, and we actually have it recorded inside the scriptures. And it's really profound. Um, so before we get into the word, before we start reading, I want to pray one more time. Um, so if you would just, uh, yeah, pray with me. Lord, I just pray right now that you would speak your words, Lord. I, I love opening your word and I love sharing your word, God, because you always teach me first. <laughs> you always humble me first. So, Lord, I pray that you would humble me, that you would feel me, Lord, that you would speak to me, Lord, and that you would speak through me, God. I pray for revelation inside of all of our hearts, God, that you would reveal yourself to each one of us, that you would take off veils in our hearts, that you would um, take scales off of our eyes and plugs out of our ears, that we would have ears to hear, hearts to listen, eyes to see. Yeah, Jesus, we ask for you to come, for you to speak, Lord. Um, I'm a foolish man, but I love that you choose to use the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. So, Lord, I pray that uh, in my feeble words that you would speak mightily. Now, Lord, open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's open up to John 17. I'm going to read John, the whole chapter of John 17 because God, uh, Jesus is actually praying, but I'm not actually going to focus on the whole chapter of John 17. I'm just going to give a, some reference for where we're going here. Um, so if we're going to start in John 17, 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give external life, et sorry, eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, Jesus and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came to you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except for the son of destruction, that the scripture may be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have, that they may have my full, jo they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For, they, for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that, they may have the, so that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them, even as you love me. 
Father, I desire also, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that I that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that they that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. I'm really blessed this morning by uh, actually the teaching from last week. I don't know how many of you guys tuned in last week or were here last week. Pat, Matt Mozaleski from Calvary Chapel Fredericksburg actually talked about Christ-centered community. And I was telling Trevor this morning, I didn't know what he was going to teach about. He didn't know what I was going to teach about. But I think God designed a two-part message on the church for us over these two weeks. Pat, Pastor Matt, talked here, and this today we're going to be talking about beginning and the end, before and after and what that looks like, as well as the middle of community and unity and oneness inside of the body of Christ. Um, Trevor's been asking me for about two weeks now, hey, what's the message? What's, what's, the, what's the title for this message? And I told him, I was like, brother, I don't know. I've been trying to figure this title out for like three weeks now, and the Lord just really hadn't given it to me. So last night, whenever I was in the shower, the Lord told me oneness. So if you're taking notes, you can title this thing oneness. Um, and hopefully, we'll all be one <laughs> after this is over. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty excited about those things that the Lord's doing. So we'll be starting in verse 1, um, and let's talk about verse 1 for a second, or verse 1 through 5. In verse 1 through 5, I'm just going to kind of skim over a lot of this, just kind of give you a little bit of background. We read that whole passage, but in verse 1 through 5, we see Jesus, he talks about and he prays for his glory and his preeminence in everything inside of salvation, including salvation. The same language is, is with this inside of these entire verses. In him, with you. In him, with you. In verses 6 through 9, we see Jesus pointing out that he has given the words of life that were given to him from the Father and that we have received. He prays for the believers and not for the unbelievers, which is interesting. In verses 10 through 19, we see that all who are in Christ are God's and, and vice versa. All who are in God are, are, are Christ's and all who are in Christ are God's. He has given believers his word and it will take them out of the world. And they are no longer a part of the world, just as he is no longer a part of the world. Um, yeah, catch, if you, can't, if, you, if you catch verse 13, it's uh, pretty interesting. His words are for Christ's joy to be fulfilled inside of us. It's an interesting thing that's powerful. His words, which are truth, make the world hate us, and it brings us into a different plane than the rest of the world is on. Basically, what we find out later in Scripture is that um, we have died and been raised with Christ. So we, are no longer, we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Christ, Jesus. We're basically citizens now of the heavenly realm. So we must be sanctified in Christ's truth. And that sanctification only comes through his word. So we're going to get into verse 20 through 26, which is the main part of what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, so what I really want to drill down and focus on this morning is that he begins praying not only for the disciples, not only for us believers, but he begins, well, he begins praying for the disciples in the first part, and then he begins praying for us, the believers, um, where he says in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. Why? Does he pray for those who will believe in him through the word? Verse 21, so that, so that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and they also may be in us. I'm not going to get too much into the Trinity here, but this is, a, this is a picture of the Trinity. This is a picture of what we're seeing in oneness. We have three God parts, the Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus, who are all completely one, who are all completely separate. And so what God is calling us, or what Jesus is praying for us here, is praying for us to be one, the body of Christ to be one, just as that. We're all separate people, completely separate people, who are all one inside of Jesus Christ. We're all one. Why? What is that? Why is that? Look at verse 21, the end of 21. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
Why are we one? Why are we together as one? So that the world may believe that he has been sent. It is a tool for evangelism. Our unity as the body of Christ and in the body of Christ is a tool for evangelism in the world. If you look at Acts 2, 42 through 47, which is the early church, right after Pentecost, we have all these guys gathering together in unity, gathering together and doing things together, and they're one. Verse 47 says, and the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Why? Because of their unity. People saw their unity and they said, hey, I see that, I love that, I want to be a part of that. They were going and selling everything they had. They were meeting inside of each other's homes. They were seeing miraculous signs and wonders happening constantly, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And what happened? The Lord added to their numbers daily. It's not hard these days to see a lot of disunity inside of the world, inside of the body of Christ even. We have a lot of pastors backbiting and eating each other up. We have people inside of our churches who say, well, I didn't really like that sermon, so I'm going to leave this church and go to that church. I didn't really like that sermon over here, so I'm going to leave that church and go to that church. I don't really like how they're spending the money over here, so I'm going to leave that church and go to that church. There's tons of disunity, tons of disunity in this world. Why? Why do we have disunity? Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians um, 1. I'm going to read 10 through 13. Paul kind of gives us a little bit of this inside of it. Um, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of evil inside of the world. The enemy wants to destroy everything that we have inside of our unity so that our evangelism doesn't, doesn't happen. Our oneness in Christ is evangelism in itself. So verse 10, Paul's talking to the church in Corinth here, and he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Apollo, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, Christ isn't divided. How did we come into the faith? How do we come into the church? It's through who? Christ, it's Jesus, it's only Jesus. There's no division in Christ because he's the only way. Think about that for a second. How many of us men spend time being apart from everything else? How many of us people in the flesh, we say, well, I just want to, I don't really like these people. I don't really spend time with these people, so I'm going to be apart. We do it a lot. We do it a whole lot. We follow men. Christ says, the, the scripture says, don't follow men. Paul's even talking about himself. These are three of the people that were the, the founders of the faith. You have Paul. You have Peter, who was the rock, if you remember. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build the church. So Peter, the rock which the church was built upon, right? And then you have Apollos, who was also an early evangelist. These, through these three people, we saw a whole bunch of cool, crazy stuff happen inside of the church. But he's saying, on these three people, we should never be divided because these three people are nothing. It's only Jesus to keep in everything. Uh, Let's go back to John 17 for just a second. Uh, Don't follow any leader that's pointing you back to Jesus. We see in John 17, how does Christ say to sanctify herself? In John 17, um, where is it? John 17, 17, it says, sanctify them in the truth. And your word is the truth. We want to be sanctified by the word of God. There's nothing for us to be divided on except for on Jesus. It's just on Jesus. Don't believe me? Let's look at Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 1. We've been going through uh, Colossians through our Sunday, our Wednesday services for a little while here now, but I'm going to go through Colossians 3, 1 through 11 here. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. This is what I was talking about earlier. We're on a different plane whenever we come into Christ. Different plane. We've been died with him. We've been raised with him. Now we're new creations inside of him. 
Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the, heavenly, at, the, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Um, we see in verse 5 through uh, 9, we're going to see a little bit of what that looks like. So we put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurities, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when we were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put, to, put off your old self with his practices and have been put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all inside of the body of Christ, inside of us who have believed in Christ, there's no other option but for us to be one because Christ is all and in all. Our jobs don't matter anymore. Our positions don't matter anymore. Our ethnicity doesn't matter anymore. What we've learned doesn't matter anymore. You see, they're circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, Greek, Jew. None of those things matter anymore. The only thing that matters is Christ. He is the only thing that matters. None of those things divide us. If you look at the news today, the news is going to tell you, hey, all of these things divide you. Your class, your race, your job, your whatever thing that you believe, they all divide you. But brothers and sisters, I have truth for you today. The only thing that keeps you not divided is Jesus Christ. The only thing. I tell people all the time this one thing. Marriage is the hardest thing that you'll ever do. Why? Because you have sinful man, sinful woman, who are supposed to be coming together and become one pure holy bride. And for all of us who are married, that's impossible. It's impossible. But through Jesus Christ, it is absolutely and 100% possible. The word in, uh, we, we speak Hindi and Urdu where we are. The word in Hindi and Urdu, Urdu is, is na mumkin. Mumkin means impossible. So it's not possible to do those things. It's completely, never can you do it. But God takes the things that are impossible and makes them possible. And that's his plan, is to change the thoughts of the wise and make foolishness Wisdom. His foolishness is so much more than our wisdom. In him we are one. Not of our, none of our beliefs are even, are even able to split us. So I ask this, this question to all of us this morning. How are we divided? How are you making divisions inside of the body of Christ? Or are you making divisions inside of the body of Christ? Even social justice can't divide us. But don't hear me saying that slavery or social justice things aren't good. Those things aren't something that we should be working for. Micah 6, 8, one of my favorite verses on that says, uh, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. But the point is, is that Jesus is before all those things. Jesus goes before. He's preeminent in everything. As he prayed, though I love that in John 17, the very first thing that Jesus prays for is himself. He prays and thanks God for all of his preeminence, that he was before all things, and him and God had made all of this plan before everything. All right, now that I've established that, now let me pray for these that are right here in front of me, the disciples, those who are going out. I'm sending them out. Now that I've prayed for all that, now I'm going to pray for all of the rest of it. He's about himself because he knows that himself is the best. Let's be honest. How often do we hang out or divide ourselves based off of our own preferences? How often are we divided in the church on how money spends, who we hang out with, what the message was, what was chosen for, who was chosen for leadership or not? I wasn't be able to be a part of this. I didn't want to do this. And then we decide to split off from the church. We amputate our part of the body. We throw it away and say, hey, I'm going to go to a different place. I'm going to do something different. Not because of Christ, not because of his words, 
but because of our own wants and desires or beliefs or hopes. None of these things are to divide us. Only Christ divides us. Now, reality is, will we have arguments inside of the body of Christ? No, never. <laughs> never will we have arguments. You know, we're just all one-minded. We're all perfect. Absolutely, we're going to have arguments. Will we have fights? 100%. Um, if we look at that marriage kind of example that I used just a minute ago, me and my wife have a fair share of what I would like to call Iron sharpens iron. Conversations. <laughs> Probably had a couple this morning. But we are constantly in unity. It doesn't separate us. Do we believe the same thing? No, we don't. My wife and I don't. I love baseball. She couldn't care less about it. She loves to watch the news. I hate to watch the news. Does that really change us, though, does that change our unity? Does that change our oneness? No, it doesn't. And just because we have different preferences, just because we have different gifts and we have different things that we enjoy, doesn't change our oneness in Jesus Christ. It doesn't destroy our unity. Uh, let's go to Ephesians 4 for a second. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, this is Paul talking again, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I hope you guys are kind of catching this whole thing, right? There's the unity, there's spirit, there's this whole thing that's going on here. We're talking about oneness. This isn't just in John 17. This kind of goes throughout the entire Bible. Um, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, to the one hope that belongs to your call, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We are all one in God, all of us, whether I'm in India, which is where we spend most of our time, or I'm here. We, inside of the body of Christ, those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ, who love him and are called according to his purposes, we are one. The one spirit goes inside of each one of us. That one spirit calls us to love and to walk in oneness with each other. Because of that one spirit, one baptism, one faith, we all share that one thing. It's a oneness inside of Jesus. Nothing of ourself. If we aren't walking in his ways, then you know what? We'll definitely be causing a wedge in between us. That's why he says right here, walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling which which you have. Walk in a manner. It would be kind of like working for Ford. I used to sell cars with Toyota, but it'd be kind of like working for Ford. And while you're working for Ford, you're outside and everywhere that you go, you got Chevy clothes on all the time. And you're telling people, hey, you know, you need to go and buy a Ford. And, and everybody's looking at you and they're saying, you've got all, maybe racing fans will catch this, you've got Jeff clothes on, the kid. You got the kid clothes on. You're wearing Chevy. Why are you wearing all these Chevy clothes? Why are you a Ford man selling for Ford if you're talking about, if you're wearing Chevy stuff? Or it would be like same situation, a different, a different kind of analogy for you. Same situation, you're selling Ford. Someone walks up on the, on the lot and they, all that you can talk about it, how Ford is trash and Chevy's wonderful. You know what? Oh man, I hate this F-150. That Silverado is really great. You wouldn't sell very many cars, would you? You wouldn't last very long at Ford either, would you? How often are we inside of the body of Christ doing those things as well? We are saying one thing, but living a different life. Or living a different life, or sorry, we are living a life, but then speaking completely opposite. Coming to church on Sundays, you're coming to church on Wednesdays, you're in church, but then whenever you're out of church, you're doing something completely different. Those things will wedge us. Those things will split the body of Christ. How many church splits do we see these days? A lot of it is on these, these small little things. 
because we're walking in disunity. We're walking in disobedience to God. Oneness is what Christ has desired and prayed for us to do. Another thing that will disrupt our unity is if we're walking in sin, obviously away from Christ, then we'll be divided. Jesus is the only thing that can divide us. A theological difference should not divide us unless it's, her- unless it's heresy. Do you know one thing that's really fun that we like to do these days inside of our body of Christ, inside of the church? So you say, hey, I believe in this. I read this verse, and I believe this. And you say, well, I can't sit with you because I read this verse and I believe this. You know, one thing that happens in, in Philippians 3, I'll uh, read that. I love this verse in Philippians 3, uh, if I can find it. Maybe I didn't mark it. I won't read it. Philippians 3, uh, 12 through 16, it talks about this. I don't have time to read it, but basically it says, well, actually, I couldn't find it, so I don't read it. I have it written in my notes. I don't have time to read it, but I... Uh, I can't find it, so I'm not going to read it right now. Um, But it basically says, let us look forward to where Christ is seated at the heavenlies, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And if we are mature, as we seek him, he will reveal all truths to us. All we are supposed to do is hold hold true to that which we've attained. Don't let these little pebbles in the road divide us, cut us up. Make us into something else. Let's go to sec- to First Corinthians three. We're going to read verses one through nine. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you this morning, but I believe that the that the word is what washes us, and the word is what sanctified us. That's what Jesus prayed. I shouldn't give you a whole bunch of different examples. I should just give you the word, and that's what I'm trying to give you this morning. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. This is Paul talking to the fir- to the to the church at Corinth. But as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, I cannot address you as spiritual people, but people of the flesh and as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for it. If you were, if you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Paulus, are you not being merely human? Are you not being merely men? Are you living on that spiritual plane that I talked about earlier? Are you living out of the world? Are you living in the world? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Check it out. They're one. They're one. If Tim's up here preaching, if Matt's up here preaching, if, if uh, Scott's up here preaching, if Trevor's up here preaching, it doesn't matter. We're all one. In Christ, and each will receive his will, his wages, according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. We see Paul coming back to this unity in his letter at church in Corinth. They were obviously having some problems with it there. Um, he kind of goes back through it through this whole First Corinthians book of First Corinthians. He says he can't even count them as mature believers or those who are not of the flesh. The believers are doing basic things that fall off of us whenever we come into Christ. Jealousy, backbiting, destroying each other. He said they're doing the he said, she said type of stuff. He also says that we all have a job to do in the church, none higher or lower than the other one. I'm up here sharing today. These guys are over here sharing in the booth. Somebody's outside in the parking lot. All of those things are one. They all work for the same goal, which is to make Jesus Christ known. And they're so elevating and, what do you call it? Elevating and bringing people down. I can't think of the other opposite word of that. That's probably my Mississippi kicking in. Elevating and descending? I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. That that whole thing right there, um, that shouldn't happen because it's all one. The only person that stands above is Jesus Christ. That's like saying, hey, hand, you're not good because the wrist is where it's at. But if you take the wrist away, what is the hand? Nothing. All right, hey, wrist, you're not awesome because the elbow is. 
Take the elbow away, what happens there? Nothing. Take the shoulder away, what happens to there? Nothing. Christ is the head, and we're all one together inside of this thing. Was anyone more important? No. No. No, in fullness, we have to have all parts which are working under and for and through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. To achieve the things that Pastor Matt was talking about last week in a Christ-considered, Christ-centered community, who has to be the center? You can say that out loud. Who has to be the center? Christ. That's right. To be in Christ-centered community, Christ has to be the center. Oh, a water fell out of my foot. Um, sorry. That's right, Christ. Unless he's the center, then nothing else will change. Let's go back to uh, 217. To John 17. Why do we need to become one? Back to verse 21. So that the world will believe that you have sent me, that Jesus has been sent by God, so that the world will believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, I hear a lot of believers and a lot of unbelievers and a lot of people who have been in the church come back and say, you know, I can't, believe, I can't be a believer of Jesus Christ because I've seen the church. I've seen his church. And, uh, you know, I used to be kind of that person, had a complicated relationship with the Church of Christ. I grew up in it all of my life. My mom kind of dropped us off at the church as a babysitter. We were there where I grew up in Mississippi. It wasn't if you went to church, it was what church you went to. The Methodists were the church that I went to, and so we obviously knew the way to Jesus. The Baptists didn't. Neither did the Presbyterian. Neither did the Lutheran. Neither did the Calvary Chapel. None of those guys knew it. It was the Methodists. They had the way to Jesus Christ. We were divided. We could come together for VBS, but we couldn't come together for anything else because, no, you can't do that. But Jesus is more than all of that. I uh, About three years ago, the Lord really started smashing me in the face with this verse, with this uh, thing. I had a complicated relationship, and I was seeing inconsistencies, doctrinal issues, uh, what do you call it, not hypothetical, what's my word here, hypocritical lives being lived out by pastors, people in faith, all these things. And I said, man, I just want to, I don't, I don't like the body of Christ. Give me all these unbelievers. <laughs> I'll, I'll hang out with unbelievers because I can forgive their sins. They don't know better. What about the body of Christ? And God sat me down one evening, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. He said, that's my bride, boy. That's my bride. Who are you to judge my bride? If you want to be a part of it, then you look me in the face, boy, and I'll lead you into loving me, which will make you love them more. I find that true in my own marriage that if I look into the big brown eyes of my beautiful wife, then you know what happens? I love her more and I spend more time with her. I love her more. But guess what? I also love my three boys more. I love them so much more. And I can easily see when I don't love them, I haven't been spending time with my wife well. This past week, I've been sick. My wife's been busy. My kids have been crazy. They've been home they went to school for three days, and then school shut down because the principal got COVID, and so the school was shut down, um, and so they were back home, and man, I was really agitated with my kids most days. But last night, I, I was in the shower, and I just really felt like God said, you know why, why you're not loving your kids well? Because you haven't spent any time with your wife. You haven't loved your wife well. How often are we inside of the church looking around at everybody else's log or speck in their eye whenever we're not looking at Jesus to take the log out of our own eye? We come to church and we pick apart the speaker's message and we pick apart the worship and we pick apart, well, that person didn't say hi to me today. That person didn't spend time with me today. They didn't come out to eat with us. Well, I'm just not going back. Hmm? Hmm? I'm just not going to go back. I'm not going to... Let's see, Pastor Matt gave a story last week where he said the little kid, the little girl kept coming down the stairs at this party, kept coming down the stairs, and the parents looked over and were like, hey, why did you, why do you keep coming down? She said, I just wanted to see if they would miss me. How often do we do that? Well, the pastor's not reaching out for me to discipleship, so I'm not going to get discipled by him. Newsflash, 
Disciples run after the people who they want to be discipled by, not the person who's the disciple, the person who's trying to disciple running after the disciple. If you see the 12 constantly ran after Jesus, Jesus turned around to the masses constantly and said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but those who come after me, the son of man has nowhere. And you come after me, you ain't going to have anywhere either. Pick up your cross and follow me. You're going to go to the death, a terrible death. Follow me. Whenever he had these big crowds, and the crowds just were like, well, this dude's crazy. I'm not going to do that. And they dwindled back down to the 12, those who ran after him. Don't you want to be one who runs after him today? As we run after Christ, we will be unified. We will be one. I've got a couple more verses for us. Forgive me. I love... Um, oh, forgive me. I'm actually going to stop for a second. Sorry, forgive me. I said forgive me like five times right there. Um, John 17, let's keep moving through, verse 22. The glory that you have given me, God, Jesus says, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. In them, I in them, and you and me, so that they may be perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus also desires in verse 24 that we would be with him in glory. Those who call upon his name, those who live in this unified life with Jesus Christ, they will be with him for eternity. He'll be hanging out in heaven with him. That's his prayer for us. O righteous Father, in verse 25, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. And I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love that which you have loved me may be in, may be in them, and I in them. So some of you may be thinking, uh, what does all this mean for me? I live in unity. I'm not beating up people. I'm not tearing people up. Our church is pretty unified. We hang out all the time. We do all these cool things. You know, we may be split on A's and B's, but we're coming back together. We're all going to be in unity. Some of you may be thinking, well, I'm, I was thinking to leave the church tomorrow. So what does all this mean to us? I would say first, let's let the Holy Spirit speak to you, the Word of God speak to you, and, let, and then make a step of faith Depending on what the Holy Spirit says, let me tell you something that's truth. The Word of God will be a testament to something that you hear from God in the Spirit. Secondly, the testament of two and three faithful believers also confirms those things that you've heard from God. So if you hear from God, I should just go and get a needle and inject myself a couple times with some heroin. You're not hearing from God because that's not inside of the Bible. Well, you know what? I should go and confront this person about their sin. If the scriptures are telling you that, and then you have two and three faithful witnesses coming to you and saying, yes, that is something that you should do, then you can be sure that those are something that the Lord is telling you to do. It's not just a thought. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 is one of the verses that I would point you to. We see Paul telling his evangelism strategy. It says, and when I came to you, I came, I came, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech and wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We see Paul telling you his evangelism strategy. He comes only clinging to Christ. Are you, brother and sister, are you only clinging to Christ today? Have you let other things come in between you and Jesus and then in between you and his church? Yeah, I'll be darned if 
whenever God told me to look at him and it would make me love his church all the more, I'd be darned if it hadn't happened. I love his church more now today than I ever have. See the inconsistencies? Absolutely. See the hypocritical things? All the time. But do I love his body more than I ever have? And so that's one reason I get really scared when I'm inside of the body of Christ because I'm like, man, I love these guys. I love these guys, but I want to go to where those who have never heard are. Let's uh, look at, secondly, I'd point you to John 13. Remember we started today talking about John 13 through John 16. In John 13, verses 34 and 35 Christ gives his disciples. He's already sent Judas out, the son of destruction, as we read about earlier, that he didn't keep with him. He's already sent Judas out, and he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. He's talking to the disciples, just the disciples. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says it will be known by our love. How are you doing loving? Not just those outside of the church. How are you doing loving those inside of the church? Are you loving first the Jew and then the Gentile? Are you loving first the church and then the unchurched? A big condemnation on my life was that I was the opposite. Let me love the, un, the, the unchurched. Let me love the unbeliever. And then, you know, the church lasts. I'll give them scraps. But Christ has called us to one in each other so that we can then love outwardly. If you're not, why are you not loving the church? Why are you not loving your brothers and sisters? And how do you do changing that? Today, um, before we close, I just want to ask a couple of questions to you. If you hadn't trusted in Jesus, would you be willing to think about what are the reasons why you haven't trusted in Jesus today. Is it people? I've already read to you, Paul said, people don't matter. The main thing that matters is Jesus. He's the one. Our oneness is in him. People are going to fail you. Jesus will never fail you. And if you want to take that next step forward in finding Jesus, I would encourage you to talk to one of the elders or deacons here in the church or just come and find me. I'd love to talk to you more about him. A second question is, are you distracted by other things that are pulling you away from unity inside of Jesus Christ and inside of his body? Are you seeking Jesus or are you seeking blank? You can fill in that blank. And are you willing to give that up? All of these things, everything that we're talking about, um, I always bring it back to counting the cost. The cost. And Luke 14, 25 through 33, we see Jesus doing what I talked about earlier. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his life, father and mother and wife and children and brother and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desires to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet great way off, he sends a delegation and asks the terms of, for terms of peace. So therefore, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple Whenever people come and talk to me about faith, I kind of, I'm not, I'm not one of those ones that says, "Hey, come jump in, just jump in, everything's gonna be okay." I'm the one that's like, "Hey, wait up." The cost is great. Jesus Christ, if you don't know, has given us a free gift of salvation. That cost you everything. 
It costs you your life. It costs you your hopes. It costs you your dreams. And it is so worth it. So worth it. Your life changes. It cannot stay the same. Every part of your life is transformed. Are you willing to give it up? What are the things that are holding you back from being one in Christ, one with your brothers and sisters, one in the church, one body, one spirit, one baptism? Um, just a short story before we, before we quit, before we quit, before I close. Um, following him and making him known because of our unity really matters. In our time in India, we've seen one Muslim guy come into the faith. I've spent a lot of time evangelism, debating, sharing strategies, all these crazy things. Um, do you know what the one thing that made this guy come into the faith was? Our family, our teammates' family, being one in unity made that guy come into the faith. You ask him today, why? What made you come into Jesus? And he said, because I watched the oneness inside of you guys and I see the love that you have for each other. And it didn't come from blood, didn't come because your family, didn't come from your race, didn't come from anything else. It came from this Jesus, and I wanted it. I want it. Was it hard to keep the unity in our team? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. But was Jesus glorified? For sure, he was. Count the cost today, brothers and sisters. Today is a day of salvation. Today is a day of transformation. Count the cost. Do you want to be a disciple so that your love can be seen by all? Count the cost. What's holding you back? Are you willing to let those things go? Yeah, let me pray for us. Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for your willingness to let us be one. The oneness that we have in you is, it's good, Lord. <laughs> we find people every now and then where our, where our soul just says, yeah, I feel this. This is the oneness that we have, Lord. But reality is, is that every single one of us who calls on your name, Jesus, who has received your spirit has oneness in you, Lord. Build us in that one. Just as Jesus prayed that day, Lord, I pray that for us today, Lord. Let us be unified. Let us be one in you, one in the Father, one in each other, because you are one, Lord. Lord, I pray for those who are, yeah, they're running away from you because of what they've seen from other people. God, I pray that they would count the cost today, God, that they would look to you, that they would say, God, I don't want to just step in half-heartedly. I don't want to just step in with one foot. I want to step all the way into you. Because you're worth it. No matter of man, no matter of anything else, will pluck you out of my hand. Pluck, pluck me out of your hand. Yeah, Lord, we thank you. We praise you, God. We thank you for your word. Let it reveal its purposes. Let it accomplish it, Lord. Accomplish the things that you've set out today inside of our hearts, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand once again?
There's an old uh, Jars of Clay song that's called, They Will Know That We Are Christians By Our Love. It goes, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know that we are Christians by our love. We are one, there we go, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and they'll know that our unity will one day be restored, and they'll know that we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. Yeah, Jesus is good, and he is one, and we are one in him. Uh, I want to send you out just like Jesus prayed in John 17. Uh, But before I go, consider Jesus today. Consider him. Today is the day of salvation, brothers and sisters. Consider him. And if you don't know Jesus, please come talk to one of us. And if you want to take the next step in Jesus, consider talk to one of us. Because there's so much more in him. And I, after 19 years, am just still scratching the surface. So in John 17, I'm going to paraphrase this. Um, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world. Just as Jesus was not of this world, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep these from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as Jesus was not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent Jesus into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Let their light shine in this world and let your kingdom grow in and through them, just as you are in and through them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be blessed this week, body.